Today on Real Garage, it's time to stiffen the old girl up. We're gonna install the frame connectors to tie in the rear frame to the front clip. Normally, the front subframe is only held to the body with four bolts. But with the horsepower that we're using, we really need these frame connectors, as well as the roll cage, to stiffen the body up and keep it from twisting. To install these connectors, we'll need to cut out some of the floor pan and seat mount. While I'm making my cut marks, why don't you check out one of my real projects on a custom way to store your extension cords. So today I'm going to do another one of those projects to help optimize my garage space. I've been looking for ways to store my extension cords. And it seems like everything I find is racks or hooks or something like that but they're all laid out in a horizontal format and I'm really looking for something that I can stack the cords inside each other, but I've not been able to find anything, so I'm gonna make something myself. So this is what I'm looking at trying to do. I've laid out my extension cords on the floor and I'm gonna be putting them inside of each other. I took a piece of construction paper and I drew some radius cuts on it. And what I'm gonna do there is make some shelves. They're gonna be four inches wide and I'm gonna make these shelves and I'm gonna weld them to this back plate. On the shelves, I'm gonna weld these little divider tabs. These tabs will allow me to stack extension cords up on the shelves without having them intertwine on each other and get all tangled up. When I'm done with this project, I should be able to put at least a dozen extension cords in this very same footprint. So that's gonna save space on my wall. I'm using 5052 aluminum for this project. If you've seen any of my other projects, you'll know that I like working with aluminum because it's strong, it's lightweight, it doesn't rust, and it looks good in its natural form, so I don't even have to paint it. I'm going to be using a spool gun on the Multimatic 220 ACDC. Step one is going to be taking a piece of construction paper and laying out your shelf locations and determining the radius which you need to bend for those shelves. So an easy way to determine that is to take a magic marker and tie a string to it. And for me, uh, I'm making my first cut on the back plate, which is not actually going to be a shelf radius, it's just going to be the top part of the back plate. I'm making that radius at 16 inches. So if you measure from the point of your marker out 16 inches and use that as your radius point, you can draw yourself a consistent radius along your construction paper. So my top piece I'm making at a 16 inch radius. My first shelf, which is gonna hold two or three 230 volt extension cords, that's gonna be a 13 inch radius. My third radius is gonna be a 10 inch radius. My fourth one's gonna be a seven, and my last one is gonna be a four inch radius. So basically I'm coming down at three inches on each one of those radiuses. Once you draw that out on your construction paper, now you can take a, a thin tape measure and you can measure the length of what your shelf needs to be. Also, this is a good time to determine the spacing of your shelves because if you have more extension cords on this one, you're going to need more room between the shelves to get those extension cords to be pulled out. Plus, I'm welding in those separation tabs between those extension cords, so you're going to have to lift up over the top of those as well. So my first set of extension cords will have a distance of six and a half inches. My next one's going to be five inches, and my last one is going to be three inches. And that'll give me plenty enough room to get those extension cords off of that shelf. So the back piece where we're going to weld the shelves to is going to be 24 inches by 28 inches. So I've got the 24 inches already cut and I need to mark the 28. Earlier we mentioned that the shelf width was going to be 4 inches but the lengths are gonna be determined by the radiuses. So my top shelf is gonna end up being 33 inches long. The next shelf is gonna be 26, followed by a 16 inch shelf, and my smallest shelf is gonna be 10 inches. So we're gonna cut those right now.
My next step is to cut the radius in the top of my back mounting plate. I'm going to use the same technique that I used on the construction paper with the magic marker and the piece of string. However, a plasma cutter is almost like a laser. It's very precise. So if you are going to freehand cut that radius, if you wiggle or move any little bit, it's going to show up in your cut. So I'm going to kind of do the same thing I did. I'm going to attach a piece of string to the end of my plasma torch. Now I'm attaching it using a small hose clamp and I'm attaching it to the insulator cup on the end of the plasma cutter, not the contact tip. The contact tip conducts electricity, but the insulator cup does not. So this is where I'm going to connect that string to and I'm going to measure that same radius out and I'm going to use that as my guide. Keep in mind that your plasma torch and the string must be perpendicular. If it's not, when you're running it through your radius, the string is either going to wind up or unwind, causing your radius to be off. It's going to be higher or lower. So, you know, you want to make sure that your plasma torch and string stay perpendicular to each other as you're making that cut. And it will give you a perfect radius. So, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take and measure my center point. So on, on this piece it's 28 inches long, so that's 14 inches. I'll make my center mark there. I'll make another center mark down here and I need to measure about 16 inches along that because that's where my, that's what I said our radius was going to be for that top. 16 inches is right there. So this is where I'm going to hold that piece of string as I'm going to make my cut. Before you get started, remember, read and follow all labels and your owner's manual. So now I need to make the divider tabs for my shelves. For my purposes, my divider tabs are gonna be a little bit different sizes because I'm putting the 240 volt cables up on the top shelf and they're a little bit thicker, so I'm making those divider tabs a little bit longer. Uh, I'm making all the tabs one inches wide, but my top shelf, the tabs are gonna be three inches long with a one inch 90 degree bend on the bottom. My intermediate shelf is gonna be three and a half inches long, again with a one inch bend, and the bottom shelf are going to be three inches long uh, with a one inch bend. So that'll give me a total of three inches on the top shelf, two and a half inches on the intermediate shelf, and two inches on the bottom shelf. Those divider tabs will be used to separate the extension cords to make it easier for me to remove them from the rack and prevents them from getting tangled together. After you cut your divider pieces, make sure you round your corners and deburr any sharp edges. On my divider tabs, I'm marking one inch from the end. And then I'm gonna take them over to my bender and I'm gonna bend these at a 90 degree. So now we're gonna take our shelves that we cut earlier and we're gonna run them through the slip rolls to give us that radius that we're looking for. If you don't have a set of slip rolls, you can use anything else in the shop that has that similar radius and form that aluminum around it. You could even use a tire, a wheel, a rim. You could use a metal can or anything like that to give you that initial radius you're looking for. And then you can bring it back to your construction paper that you drew out your templates on and fit it to that and get it to the point where it matches the radius that you drew out. Now that we've got our shelves rolled, we're gonna take our divider tabs and we're gonna weld divider tabs, a set of them on the center of each shelf. And on the top shelf, because it's so long, the edge divider tabs will be about two inches from each end. The next shelf will be an inch and a half from the end. The third shelf will be an inch from the end. The fourth shelf will not get any divider tabs at all. I'm just gonna run this through the bead roller and I'm actually gonna put a little flared lip on the edge. This one's getting real small extension cords and it's just to keep them from falling off. Hooking your spool gun up to the Multimatic 220 is extremely easy. 
All you gotta do is open up your side access door, release the drive motor tension, and roll back the wire out of the MIG gun. Okay. Basically, we're just gonna take and remove the MIG gun from the machine and install the spool gun in its place. Slide the spool gun into the drive housing. That's where it's gonna pick up its weld power and its gas. Then I'm gonna rehook the trigger leads from the spool gun onto the connector. And you're done for inside the case. The only thing you have to do now is make sure you connect the argon gas that was connected to the TIG solenoid you need to move that over to the MIG solenoid so that it pushes the argon gas through the spool gun. I'm going to use the Auto City Leap to set the parameters for the machine. I'm welding 5052 aluminum using 4043 filler metal and it's 080 thick. So I'm going to be setting the machine to the 14 gauge setting. I'm going to start welding the shelves right in the middle first. Then I can set the sides to the distance I need and make sure that they're equal. extension cord project done. Now I've got all my extension cords in one location. If you're interested in organizing your shop and optimizing the space that you have available, check out some of the previous episodes of Real Garage, just like this jack stand storage project. With everything marked, I'll be using both the plasma cutter for the long runs and my air cutoff wheel when I need to cut one layer of metal without damaging the one beneath. I'm starting with cutting some of the seat mount to expose the floor pan underneath. <laughs> Screw. Then using the plasma to cut out the floor pan for the frame connectors to weld to. I set my plasma for about 17 amps for this thin material. Perfect. That'll just get welded all the way around and from the underside. For these end caps, I'm using 116th ER70S2 filler metal. Normally, I weld these subframe connectors solid from the front frame all the way to the rear frame. But on this one, I want to be able to remove the front clip in case I damage it. So I made these bolt-on adapters for this. You know, I don't plan on just driving this car to work and back. I plan on competing it in some autocross, road courses, you know, even some drag races and why not drifting too. And I've got a friend who is a Formula Drift champion. Let's pop over to RTR and get some input from Vaughn Gittin Jr. I am here with Vaughn Gittin Jr., drift pilot of the RTR Mustang. He's heard about the project that I'm working on. Yeah, the 1969 Pontiac Trans Am, kind of a pro touring car. So 
I'm in the fabrication stage and I'm trying to I'm trying to turn this thing into more of a like a motorsports mutt, you know. I work with all forms of motorsports and I'm I really want to give this thing some some technology or some features that might make it a little bit more versatile because I'm running full-on road courses, some autocross events, maybe even some grudge match straight line drag racing. Nice. You know, and, and who doesn't get their jollies off on, you know, drifting up an empty parking lot, right? For sure. Which brings me to you, right? So, <laughs> you know, you're the Mac Daddy drifter that I know, so I wanted to come to you and maybe get some input. Like, if, if you were building your own car, right, what would you put in it? Well, you immediately make me go back to our 1969 Ford Mustang RTRX, which I'll take you across and show you in a little bit, which was a similar mindset. You know, we, we wanted something that we could drive on the street, but drift, road race, drag race, kind of a Swiss Army knife of, yeah, of yeah. a machine. That's an excellent a Swiss example. Swiss Army knife yeah. of fun, right? So it sounds like uh, you're doing something similar to that. So for me, I mean, the first thing, I mean, I think knowing you and what you do, it goes without saying you've already got the core of your performance figured out you got motor figure out I assume yeah well um so we we talked to Pat Musi if you know Pat you know he's, he's a horsepower a, machine yeah man he's great so we talked to Pat and he's like yeah we'll we'll give you 700 horse on pump gas and then we'll get a hit of nitrous and we'll get you up to a thousand okay. for the special moments you okay know? okay so that's kind of what I'm working All right, so I'm probably less than what you're working with well we've got I mean this is a uh, you know naturally aspirated 455 cubic inch uh, race motor that uh, Ford Performance and Roush 8s have developed for us. Um, we So it's 900 NA, and then we add about three, up to 300 with nitrous, wow. depending upon what we're doing. Okay. So um, based on those learnings, you know, this is, this is you know, runs VP116, so it's full race fuel. For us, we obviously wouldn't be able to have that high compression. So I think the 700 NA is great for your driver. And then when you need more juice, you got it. That's awesome. So I think based on, you know, for drifting and probably for road racing and stuff, you'll want to rely on that 700. So I assume you're going to work with him to make sure it's very drivable, give you that nice torque band. It'll be an LS platform. I okay. know he's he's Mr. Big Block, right? He makes gobs of horsepower. He's a big block guy. But in this case, we're working an LS platform. Okay. You know, dual throttle bodies, big injectors. It'll be, you yeah, know, it'll be, I think it'll be sick. Yeah, so I think, I mean, for me, I just, I, I always want the power to be where I want it, what I'm using it for. There's nothing worse than getting a motor that makes max power and then you only can use it up there, you know? So I think for what you're talking about, obviously a nice broad, broad torque band. And then the cool thing about nitrous is you can move the power wherever you want it for the maximum, right? So if you say you had a little cam, you know, cam where you had some good mid and, and you fell off on top, well, you can just use nitrous yeah. to help it up there, right? Sure, yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. But so for me, um, you know, if you want to do some drifting, I think uh, handbrake is very oh, synonymous yeah. with drifting. You want a hydraulic handbrake. Okay. Um, you, you could either do a pass-through, especially if like you're looking at weight savings and you don't want to add that other rear caliper. Um, I would suggest dual calipers, especially for a street car. Okay. Um, that way they're just two separate, two separate systems. So you have your foot brake, controlling the front and rear all the time, um, especially for road racing. And then you don't have that pass-through. We've never had an issue with something failing with a pass-through, but it's just another it's just another thing to add to the system. So for me, with a car that's doing multi-purpose, I would want my uh, our separate rear caliper. Okay. There's no, you know, when you're pulling it, you want to lock the tires, and when you're off it, you want it to unlock. So um, it doesn't need to be a huge caliper by any means. Like cooling, a lot of people don't think about, because you're always sideways. So you need to make sure you have some good fans and good ducting because you want all the air that you can get scavenged in through that. Um, the other thing is if you're putting an oil cooler or, or a power steering pump, try not to put that on the front of the radiator. Maybe put it behind or take up as little radiator space as possible because that heat will just go to the radiator. Sure, yeah. And so in drifting, think of that. you want it to be as cool as possible, which is why we, we get, not only for weight, but our real drift race cars, all of our, uh, radiators are in the in the back. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people think, you know, drifting is all about sliding and sliding. But you know, in reality, it's way more about traction. Oh yeah. Because you have to have the control, right? Oh yeah. So yeah, like the tires you're using, they're not just hard tires. They're they're like pretty yeah, sticky tires. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like anything else, right? Like it's like, at what level do you want to go to, right? So like this is a Formula Drift car. This car is purpose-built for driving sideways at over 100 miles an hour. Yeah. 
So everything from, you know, alignment all the way to light weighting to where the weight is put is all to achieve forward bite and side bite, which makes the car drive out of the corners and be very fast while spinning the tires. However, you know, at the amateur and fun level, there's way, a whole bunch of ways to achieve it. So when I'm asked questions at that level, my mindset goes to reliability and l less maintenance and just having fun behind the wheel. Okay. Um, so that's where I'm at in, the, in this discussion. So as far as tires, like we run Nitto NP555 G2s. Um, they're super sticky, uh, like insane sticky. I mean, this pull, the car pulls the front corners off the ground off a street tire. <laughs> um, Traction A, reliability Z. Uh. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? And, and, they, and, and so we have a, a compound. This is their drift spec, which is made in one size um, for, for you know, Formula D drivers and other drivers that want that next level of performance. But the tire that they use, the NT555 G2, is a summer tire, it's a 300 tread wear, and it lasts forever. It's like the perfect, I wanna drive to the track, like all around type tire. So that's um, what you would put on your own that's personal That's what I would put street, on my personal street, street car. Yep. Okay. All my street Mustangs have that tire. No, okay, okay. So, you yeah. know, there's obviously other tires you can use. I just know that tire very well, and the quality of that tire. You know, the other thing with drifting is that, you know, you will warm them up, but, they're gonna see temperatures of over 400 degrees. So you don't want a tire that's gonna come apart. Yeah. So mindset would be like, well, I'm just gonna get a harder tire because it's gonna last longer. Yeah, yeah. But the problem with the harder tire is when they get to those heats, they okay. usually come apart. Okay. So, um, you know, you just wanna find a good tire that can handle, you know, 120, you know, 120 degrees after your first burnout all the way up to three, 400, you're gonna see because you're just having too much fun, you don't wanna stop. Right, right. It's so cool having a, a car like that. I mean, our my company is RTR, ready to rock. Like my mindset is always like, how much can I do with one vehicle? You know, rather than have so many different vehicles, like, can we just change the suspension and go do that? Yeah. And uh, you can. And you know, one thing we didn't talk about though is jumping. You gonna jump this car? No, I'm gonna try and keep it on the ground. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I don't. Right. I don't think Fair I'm enough. gonna jump it. No. Fair enough. No, we'll, we'll keep. If I'm gonna jump, if I'm gonna jump, something's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I no, hear that. But I grew up asphalt circle track racing, so this is a little bit out of my comfort zone. I've yeah. done some road course racing, but you know, this is this is a little bit out of my comfort zone, which is it's what attracted me to the project. You yeah. know. But uh, I, I think it's gonna be cool, but. Thanks a lot for taking the time. I'd love to see your, your car that you drive on the yeah, street. I'll take care of that. All right, super. So this is the uh, RTRX. It's a 1969 Ford Mustang. Uh, we built this in 2011 um, and debuted at SEMA. It was a project that we did with a video game company. It was built, put into a game, and immortalized. And uh, yeah, we still have it. Uh, it's one of my favorite projects. In fact, a lot of people know and some people don't know, but we built Ken Block's Unicorn RTR here right across the street at the, you know, where, where you just saw my race car. And um, this was basically the older brother to the Unicorn. So following this build, uh, it's roughly right around a couple years later is when Ken and I talked about the Unicorn. And so this was some inspiration for the Unicorn. Obviously we went a little bit more crazy with that vehicle, but the vision here was very similar to you know, your, your vision, uh, which is to build a, a Swiss Army knife of vehicles that can, you know, drive on the street, go drifting, do road racing, and, um, you know, just overall be a, a really fun car. These frame connectors are 8th inch thick. I'm setting my machine to the 14 gauge setting and maybe even 16 gauge where we need to weld to the thinner floor pan material.
Thanks for stopping by. We're getting pretty far on our 69 Trans Am build. Stay tuned for more episodes of Real Garage.